Calvary Chapel, Mason City. We're finding ourselves today in the New Testament book of 2 Peter. I'd like to welcome you if you're watching online as well. Glad that you can join us. New Testament book, towards the end of the Bible, if you see 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, you've gone too far. 2 Peter, just three short chapters. Easy to miss it there. He gets in right away and he says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have uh, been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word today, Lord, we approach it as it is, the very word of God. And so I pray, God, by your Holy Spirit, beyond the words of uh, a man, that you would speak to us by the power of your Spirit, Lord. Make the book uh, speak to us. Show us who we are, Lord, and show us our Savior. Show us your grace. Correct us and encourage us. I pray against distractions, Lord, that would come from the evil one. Lord, that our hearts would be wide open before you as we approach your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First of all, a salutation common in epistles, this type of uh, reading, uh, this type of of a Bible book. There are different types of writings in the Bible. Some are narrative, some are epistle, some are prophetic. This is what you would call an epistle. It's a teaching sort of document. It's like a letter. Epistle just means letter. Uh, It's a fancy word. And so Peter wrote this letter. Notice what it says right there. First of all, he's Simon Peter. So the letter claims that Peter is the author. There's great internal evidence to prove that. For instance, in verses 16 through 18 of chapter 1, it says that he was present at the transfiguration. You remember when Peter, James, and John were taken up onto the mountain and they saw Jesus in his glory? This author was there, according to this letter. It also... Uh, in 2 Peter, refers to a letter that was written, you know, previously. So he's talking about 1 Peter. So points towards Peter being the author. Um, Also says in this letter that the author was a very close friend of the apostle Paul. So Peter's writing from Rome in about 67 AD. Roman persecution of the church is in full swing. Nero's insanity is at its peak. You remember through 1 Peter, we talked a little bit about this leader of the Roman Empire, Nero, at this time. Persecution was so heavy against Christians, they were burning them as lawn torches, essentially. It was one of the worst times that, I mean, we can't even imagine such things, but this is the climate. And so Peter is writing to these Christians that have been dispersed because of persecution. Their faith has gotten them into trouble. Their affiliation with Jesus essentially has caused them to become targets of persecution. And so Peter writes to this group of people when this persecution is at its height. Now, this letter is written about a year before Peter would be martyred for the faith. You know the story. Peter's wife was crucified in front of him. And as she was dying, tradition tells us that he comforted her with the words saying, trust the Lord. 
And as she uh, was put to death before him, then Peter afterwards was crucified and he made one request. He said, if you crucify me, just crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified right side up like my Lord. That is the, the tone of this sort of letter. If this had a soundtrack to it, maybe you could kind of picture the music in your mind. So Peter writes to this church to warn them about great danger facing the church. It's just before his death. He's very concerned about his brothers and sisters. And so he writes to warn them about great dangers facing the church, false teaching and false prophets. So if you're one of these people that likes to know the theme of a Bible book, that's the theme, false teaching, false prophets. You see, there are two primary threats that loom over God's church in the world. The first is an external threat dealing with persecutions, threats from without the church. That's what 1 Peter was about. It was how to live in this sort of life when you're suffering, when there are external threats trying to destroy the church. The second main type of threat that could destroy a church is the internal threat, hypocrisy, false teaching. Um, corruption from within. You see both of these in the book of Acts, in fact. You remember Acts chapter 4, the church goes out, they do a healing in Jesus' name, the, the religious authorities bring them in, they beat them, they whip them, they say, you can't, prophet, you know, you can't talk about Jesus anymore, go out and, and they beat them and they let them go. That's an external threat. See, the outside of the church, persecuting the church. Then in Acts chapter 5, we see this second type of threat, this internal threat. You remember when Ananias and Sapphira, they come into the church, they want to pretend like they're more holy than they really are. So Ananias goes, yeah, I sold my property, hundred grand. I brought all of it to the church. And he held back some money. And it wasn't the point that he held back some money. He could have held back anything he wanted. He didn't have to sell his property. But he came in and he pretended in church like he was more righteous and holy than he was. And what did God do? God just like killed him right there. And remember his wife comes in later and she says, oh yeah, we sold the property hundred grand. You know, we gave it all to the church. And Peter goes, how can you lie to God? How can you lie to the Holy Spirit? You're going to fall down and they're going to drag you out too. And the same thing happened to her. Threats from without and threats from within. I would say that the threat from within inside the church is probably more dangerous than the threats from the outside of the church. Persecution throughout church history makes the church stronger. Corruption from within inside the church, especially within its leadership, destroys the church. So 1 Peter threats from without, 2 Peter threats from within. Let me give you some insight into Peter's approach of how he deals with these false teachers. One of the best ways probably to keep, you know, to deal with illness as a human would be to be preventative. You know, if you eat right and you exercise and you don't eat a bunch of refined sugar and processed foods and you eat a lot of green vegetables and stuff like that, you're probably preventing sickness, taking supplements. It's a lot easier maybe to prevent it than it is to get rid of it. Peter's method for dealing with the false teaching is very similar. Rather than tackling the different false doctrines sort of head on, what he looks to do is to strengthen the Christians so then therefore their spiritual immune system, if you will, will recognize the false teaching. You see, that's the best remedy for false, you know, to, to protect Christians from false teaching is for them to be spiritually mature and equipped in the word of God. Now, that's Peter's approach. <clears throat> false teaching in a church is so dangerous because belief precedes action. Now, if somebody gets a hold of something that's incorrect and they base their life on it, it's something like a spiritual truth, but it's not actually true. Uh, those things can ruin a church. For instance, if I'm trying to get to Minneapolis today and you convince me that it's south of here, I'm going to be in big trouble, right? I mean, I'll end up in Des Moines being like, you know, and uh, where, how come, you know, because I believe something that was false. So in his final letter before his crucifixion, Peter aims to strengthen believers' spiritual immune system. Look at what he says there. He's a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word bondservant, it means a willing slave. Peter has made himself a willing slave to Jesus Christ. He has willfully, willingly given his life as a servant. It's a word of humility, as all Christians are called to be servants of uh, Jesus Christ. And he says that he's an apostle. Now, Peter is one of the 12 original apostles of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness to the life of Christ. And so he says he's an apostle. This is a title of authority. Peter was used by God to write authoritative scripture. Now, 
in the sense that there were apostles in the early church, there are no apostles like that today. And I say that just to sort of caution you, to sort of build your spiritual immune system, because there are those today that call themselves apostles and they proclaim that they have the same sort of authority as a Peter or a Paul, and, and their words are in their, you know, imaginations are on par with the words of scripture. And so I would say, watch out for that. A good rule of thumb is if somebody calls themselves apostle this or that, that should trigger, you know, at least a red flag in your mind. You should say, wait a minute, you know, why do you, if you were an apostle, would you really demand that people called you apostle? Anyway, that sounds kind of arrogant, you know, if you ask me. In Peter's case, it's not because this is actually his title. He says, now, to, here's who he's writing to. Look what he calls them. He calls them those who have obtained like precious faith. Now, the word attained there, so what he's saying is to the audience, you guys are saved just like I'm saved. We all have the same faith. That's what he's saying. Um, the word obtained, it means to receive by lot. That's an interesting word there that he uses. The Bible was written in Greek, translated to English. The Greek word translated obtained means to receive something by lot. In other words, you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It was given to you. You obtained it by lot. And that's what Peter's talking about there. He's emphasizing that their salvation was not earned, deserved, achieved, or merited, but it is a gift of the pure grace of God. That's a really good thing to equip a group of believers against false teaching. So many people get confused about salvation that maybe certain types of works are required in order to earn or deserve or merit salvation. You know, you say, well, believe in Jesus, but you have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to be baptized. You have to knock on doors. You have to do this or, or whatever else it is. And they're adding works to the gospel, to how salvation works. So what Peter's doing here is he's, he's reminding them this salvation was given to you as a gift, not a result of your works. It's a good thing for Christians to be grounded in. He says, a like precious faith. They are not second-class Christians. Most of Peter's audience would have been Gentiles, non-Jews. And so it would have been very comforting for them to hear that this salvation that was given, it's, it's all of us have the same thing. You're not second-class citizens. That's a good truth to, rep, you know, to remember in the body of Christ today that regardless of gender and race and financial status and nationality, all Christians are equal in the faith. We've, we've all obtained this uh, like precious faith. By the, word, by the way, the, the word precious, do you guys know who Peter was? You know, he was this rough, burly fisherman. And he uses the word precious over and over again. I love that. Jesus takes this buff, burly, you know, fisherman guy, and he's like, using him, oh, it's precious, it's precious. You know what I mean? God does that to a man, doesn't, doesn't God do that? He makes you gentle. You know, this takes some of the roughest people, and he just makes them into gentle uh, people. Peter was probably a gentle giant by this time of life. He says, by the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, that's how salvation comes. That's how faith comes in, is the righteousness of God is given to the sinner through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteous standing of Christ is given to the sinner. And that's what Peter's getting at right in the intro of this letter. Isn't that little intro so packed with theology? It's amazing. Where it says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Greek scholars would tell us, I'm not one of them, by the way, but I can read what they write. They would tell us that those two words, God and Savior, the way the Greek grammar is here is they are one in the same. It's kind of like if I say about my wife that she's my wife and my best friend. Those aren't two different people. They're the one person saying two things about the same person. And that's what that is there. So Peter's making a declaration of the deity of Christ. Very important to know because your Muslim brothers and sisters and other people will say that the, you know, uh, when I call them brothers and sisters, I don't mean that we're all saved. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, your friends, your neighbors, the Muslims would say Jesus never is, you know, called deity anywhere in the Bible and, and things like that. But in the Greek language, there's all kinds of places uh, throughout scriptures where, where Jesus is called God. In fact, you know, 
Thomas calls him, my God and my you know, Savior. I mean, there's all kinds of places, if you look carefully, where Jesus Christ is called God uh, throughout the scriptures. And, and here's one of them. So if that's interesting to you, you may outline that in your Bible. He applies this blessing to them now, this prayer. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord. Notice that there, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. That word knowledge there is more than an intellectual perception. It's an experiential, intimate knowledge. And so what he is saying is that grace and peace will be multiplied into your life proportionate to the knowledge, to the experience that you actually have with the true and living God. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge. The more intimate knowledge you have of God, the more grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, in verses 3 through 11, he's going to talk about the knowledge of salvation. So that was the little intro of the book there. And now he's going to equip them. He's going to give them some information about their salvation. First of all, in verses 3 through 4, he talks about, um, there are three words in here uh, that I want you to take notice of. One is power. The other one is promise, promises. And the other one is partakers. So you can see that in the text there when he brings it up. If you have a Bible and you like to highlight in your Bible, highlight those three words, uh, power, promises, and partakers, or you could call it participation for that last one. Verse three says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, this is quite a statement right here. It makes me think about for Christmas, uh, the guy that got a new power tool and opened his Christmas present, and he thought, well, this is just great, and opens it up and opens the box, and the power cord is gone, and, or it's not in there, or maybe it's sold separately, and some other parts that go with it, and, and so he said, well, this is nice, but I still have to go get some more things, until he discovers there's a compartment in the case, and all of the things are there that he needs. That's kind of like what he's saying here. He's saying, every single thing you need pertaining to spiritual life and godliness has been given to you in Christ. Now, this really equips the body of Christ against false teaching because I will tell you there are people making a killing off of convincing you that you have not been giving everything that you need to live a life of godliness. For instance, if you watch the Sid Roth show, you can buy for $59.99 the secrets to the deeper Christian life videos, you know? All of these people are trying to, uh, you know, out there trying to hustle these products all the time, and they would make it seem as if though you are missing some sort of knowledge that only they know, and, and they will sell it to you. In fact, you can go to a supernatural school of ministry and learn how to, you know, activate your spiritual gifts and you can pay thousands of dollars for those such things. It's actually kind of a form of Gnosticism, suggesting that there's some secret knowledge that only the initiated would have. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, in fact, you have been given everything that's needed for spiritual life and godliness. You've been given everything. And that's a good place. That's a good thing to remember as a Christian. Because I don't know about you, but there have been times where I feel like I lack uh, is something, and then I have to be reminded of this verse and say, wait a minute, you know, I know that God at salvation, he put everything into me when I became that new Christian, when I became that new creation, everything was put into me that I need. And I have to remember that every Christian should know that. You're not lacking anything. God has provided everything. Notice what he says though, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, through the knowledge of him, it's extremely important to know. Through our knowledge, our experiential knowledge of God, through that in our lives, this is how we operate in this, you know, this full, complete, everything that we need to live a life of godliness. Now, here's the next word. So that was the first word, power, right? God's divine power at work in your life has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. The next word promises, verse four says, by which you have been given 
uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. So now he's comforting them. He's saying, God's power has given you everything you need, and he also has given you these promises. When you became united with God through faith in Jesus, these promises became yours. I could list a whole bunch of them, and we could spend the rest of the time talking about them. Some of them are this, uh, the promise of eternal life, of abundant life. Remember, Jesus said, I came to give them life and abundant, life abundantly, spiritual abundance. Um, the forgiveness of all sins, past, present, and future. That's another promise that God has made to us. Uh, the promise of adoption into the family of God. The strength and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He's promised to provide for all of our needs. Remember, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. He's promised a future in heaven and either we're going to die and go there or be taken. He promises bodily resurrection at the return of Christ. He promises a forever reign with him in his kingdom. I wonder if you've comforted yourself with these promises lately as his child. When Christians are lacking comfort, when they're lacking peace in their life, it's very helpful to remind yourself of these promises that come from a God who does not lie. The next word, participation. So that was promises. Here's participation. Look at what he says. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers or participation. These are the promises before here that enable you to share in his divine nature. It really describes the worth of these promises. Through these, we are allowed to share in the very life of God. Now, there's a false teaching that goes around through the church that, that um, says, tries to teach us that we are actually little gods. I don't know if you've ever heard this doctrine. Um, if you turn on TBN at night, you can surely run into it. But people will say, um, God's big God with a big G, but you're a little God with a little G. And they will say um, that we have the same divine creative nature as God. And since we are little gods, then we're creators and we can name and claim and declare and decree things into existence, just like God was a creator. That's not what he's talking about when he says become partakers of the divine nature. What he is talking about is like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians he says that you become a new creation in Christ. You actually receive the life of God inside of you when you become a Christian and you become a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. And you become a partaker in this nature. He says, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. He's talking about Christians. Through this divine new life, you've escaped the dominating power and control of corruption, of the corrupting influence that's in this world of sin and death. And he rightfully says that the corruption that is in this world is through lust. When we look around and we see the sin, we see the destruction, we see the corruption, these things come from the, the, the sinful heart. Remember what Jesus said? He said, it's not what goes into the heart of man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of the heart of man. But Peter reminds his readers, he says, that you've escaped all that when you became a new creation in Christ. So in light of all those things, those three P words, these things that God has done, that he's given, he's given us his power, which is uh, sufficient for all things. He sustains you. He's given you divine, uh, his divine power, which is everything that you need for life and godliness. He's given you all these promises that you can bank on, and he's allowed you to become a participant in his very life and his very nature. In light of these things, now we get into this section and, you know, the rest of, uh, you know, five through seven, and now he's going to tell them that although these things are true, you must grow spiritually. Now, I think this is completely relevant for the church today. I think this is so timely because there's a confusion in the body of Christ about spiritual growth, right? You'll run into some Christians and they will, you'll say, hey, uh, you know, you got to be growing in holiness and growing in Christ-likeness. And they'll come and they'll go, oh, that's legalism. You know, you're telling me to do stuff. And, and Christianity is not about uh, rules and things like that. It's just about loving Jesus. And it's like, yeah, and that's, that's very true. Um, it is about loving Jesus. But when you're saved, God puts this new life into you. But he expects that new life to be cultivated. In other words, spiritual maturity doesn't just happen to you by accident. It's very much like going to the gym. Like you have the capability to get in shape. You know, most, you know, in most cases, people have the ability to get into shape. 
if you go and you start hitting the weights, like, you know, something, I mean, I've been hitting them and something, it's not really happening like I thought, but technically the ability is there, you know, if you feed the, you know, the muscles, the protein, the amino acids, and you, you can get stronger. Spiritually, it's the same thing. When you get saved, you receive everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness, but then you need to essentially work it out. I need to work it out. Remember where Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? So God has put something in you that you and I must cultivate. We must, you know, put some spiritual sweat into it. And that's what he's getting at right here. Look at verse five. He says, but also, word of contrast, but, he says, but also, although God has done all these things, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So that's, that's the word there, add. You need to add these things that he's going to talk about. Where he says, but also for this very reason, because of the blessings in verses 3 through 4, because of this reason, you are to add. Notice what he says there, giving all diligence. So that word means to apply maximum effort. That's the translation of the Greek word, giving all diligence. It would mean to apply maximum effort. The Christian life that honors God takes tremendous effort. It's not effort to be saved. He did that all for us. The effort is required to cultivate and grow a life of spiritual maturity. And look at where it says there, add to your faith. The word in Greek there has to do with adding lavishly. Um, when we went and did the event down in Ames last year, um, we rented the band shell and they said, we're going to provide a sound system. And I thought, oh, cool, we'll show up and it'll be like some, you know, dinky little PA system. But we got there and it was like this lavish sound system. Like, man, I wish we had a whole band, you know, because this thing was, the, I mean, they brought every single thing. I told them it was just an acoustic guitar and a mic, but this guy brought the full band set up, you know. He lavishly added to it. That's the idea. What he's saying is, for this very reason, because of all these blessings, you need to apply maximum effort to lavishly add these following things to your Christian life. God's given us all we need, so now we make maximum effort to lavishly add virtue. Look at that word there. Virtue, the word means moral excellency, uh, perfection, and God, uh, goodness of action. It's, it's the power that causes people to do morally excellent things. And so Peter is saying, you've got to add this. You've got to lavishly add this to your life. This uh, takes effort. He says you add to virtue knowledge. Again, this is the experiential understanding, the correct insight, the correct facts and understanding of Christ. Truth properly comprehended and applied into my life. To have this, I must give all diligence to pursue the truth of uh, the Word of God. Not some casual flip around Bible stuff. This is one of the things that I've been talking about with some people lately. It's like, it's very common to run into people that are Christians that would say, I think this about Jesus or I think that about Jesus. And you say, well, that's great. It might be true stuff. But you say, where's that in the Bible? And they, they're like, I'm not quite sure where that's at in the Bible. I don't really have a very good knowledge of the Bible. This is why we're doing through the Bible reading in a year. What he's saying is we have to add to this virtue, to this, we have this desire to be morally excellent and do these good things, but it has to have knowledge added to it. As a man of God, I need to be a man of the word. As a woman of God, you need to be a woman of the word. There, there's a big biblical illiteracy in churches today. And unfortunately, that's like the reason so many get into, you know, uh, false teaching and false prophecies because they, they can't detect when somebody's speaking truth or error. They decide he's talking about Jesus. It must be good. I remember when I first became a Christian, my pastor, he said that I was like a, like a baby that went around and have you ever been around when they just put everything in their mouth? You know, and you're like, don't do that. That's the cat litter box, you know. You know what I'm saying? And, oh, don't put that in your mouth. That's, those are the Legos, you know. That's, but that's kind of what Christians do. They just you know, get saved and they think, oh, you're talking about Jesus? Cool, you know. And, and everybody's all talking about the same stuff. And there's no discernment when you're a baby Christian. You don't know, like, one doctrine from the next, you know. If somebody was to ask you what's the difference between, you know, Calvinism and Arminian, they don't know these things. And I got to tell you, this is challenging to me, is, you know, 50 years ago, that was average everyday Sunday school stuff for kids. You know, kids knew doctrine. 
you know, back then. They were catechized. They went through catechism. They went through, you know, where they were taught doctrine. They could tell the difference between justification, sanctification, glorification. They knew what these things meant, right? That's what Peter says is add to virtue this, this desire to be good and morally excellent. You have to add to that knowledge. You have to have an experiential knowledge and that only comes by disciplining ourselves to be in the word. Look what he says, to knowledge, self-control. This word is like an athlete that restrains themselves, disciplines themselves with an aim to win. Remember with the apostle Paul, listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So what Paul is saying is, if I don't get this body of mine under control, I'm going to disqualify myself. Uh, because why? Because the, bo- the body wants to do things, uh, you know, that are going to uh, feed the flesh. And, uh, you know, he saw it as if he allowed himself to be controlled by his body by his appetites. He saw that as that would disqualify him from ministry. I heard Alistair Begg talking about this once, and he says, how could I ever tell somebody to stop doing heroin if I can't quit eating chocolate? You know, and it does disqualify you when you're a person with no self-control. You know, if you're uh, trying to bring up young people and say, you need to control yourself. And if they can look at you and go, but you don't, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's, it's a bad witness. He says, we have to add to this knowledge. We have to add self-control to our lives. Heard a pastor put it like this. He says, it's not taking the second helping, the second look, or having to have the last word. To self-control, perseverance. This perseverance, this is the sort of attitude that says, I will die before I give up on doing what is right. I don't care what anybody else is doing around me. I don't care if this whole world goes down the toilet. I am not going to. I'm going to stand for what's right. That's perseverance. He says to perseverance, godliness. This is reverential, respectful, loyal obedience to God. Maximum effort is to be applied to live a godly life. He says to brotherly, uh, to perseverance, uh, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, this is the word Philadelphia. Uh, This is where Will Smith was born and raised. (laughs) Every time I say the word Philadelphia, I can't get that song out of my mind from the Fresh Prince. See, I watched too much TV as a kid. This word means one who loves their brother. This is a friendly person that loves their brother. In a church, when you meet men in the church, women in the church, they should have this brotherly family type of love for one another, right? It should be the place where you go and you see your brothers and you see your sisters there and you, and you treat one another accordingly. You have this common spiritual life. Peter says, for this very reason, giving all diligence, apply maximum effort to lavishly add friendship into your life. In other words, some people are like, I'm just kind of a loner. Well, I understand. That's my, I gravitate towards that, you know. Um, But I know the Bible tells me I need to be friendly and I need to give of myself to friendship relationships. Now he adds to it. Look at this. He says, into brotherly kindness, love. Now that's the word agape. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you get an idea of what agape is. Um, This is a self-sacrificing love. This is Uh, the kind of love that Paul talks about, 1 Corinthians. Spiritual maturity has reached its highest point when I give myself to sacrificially loving others and serving others. This is the kind of love that expects nothing in return. It always seeks and serves the best interest of others, even if we get nothing out of it. Agape love does not love somebody because they're lovable or because of anything in them. Agape love originates in the lover. And so we need to always ask the Lord to put that sort of love in our hearts because it's not natural for a human. Humans naturally love because something is lovable in in the person they're choosing to love. God's agape love loves regardless. It's just a, it's a choice of the will that I'm going to sacrifice and lay down my life for every brother and sister and even my neighbors. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. This is Spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity has reached its highest when the person has come to this place of, I've sacrificially laid down my life for the good, the best interests of other people, expecting nothing 
in return. This is incredibly challenging, isn't it? I don't know about you. Start in 2024, I'm thinking about my New Year's resolutions, and I'm like, oh, here's a good list. <laughs> you know? This is not natural to me. You know, although I'm the guy standing up here, I, I want you to know clearly this is not natural to me. I need God's help for this. But I'm encouraged because I know that when I became a Christian that God's divine power has given me all things I need pertaining to life and godliness. And so I just need to cultivate these things. I need to put some sweat into it. I need to work at this. I need to put maximum effort into this. And so I'm encouraged by that. Let's look at the results of having or lacking spiritual maturity, verse 8. He says, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren or, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word knowledge again. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. So if these things, the things found in verses 5 through 7, if those things are yours and they abound, you won't be barren or unfruitful. In the book of James, chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, it says, I want you to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, his faith was made perfect. That verse in James is not saying that salvation comes by works. That verse is saying that the type of faith that receives salvation produces works. If I have saving faith, that faith works. It's not that the works earn the salvation. It's that the type of faith that I would have produces works. And so what he's saying is when Abraham essentially put his money where his mouth is and obeyed God and went and sacrificed his son. You remember what the New Testament tells us, reflecting back on that? It said Abraham knew the promises of God so much that even if he went to take Isaac to sacrifice him, the Bible says that he knew that God would raise him from the dead. He had so much faith in God that he was willing to do the most horrendous, you know, act of obedience that I could ever imagine, right? But what, the, what James is saying is he says, when you see that somebody is doing the works that proves that they have the faith. James goes on to say, show me, you know, he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, James is saying, I could go around, I could have my mouth closed and not say a thing. And you would look at my life and you would say, wow, that guy's a Christian. I can tell by the way he lives. I can tell by what he's doing. That's what James is saying. Another challenging book, man, the book of James. Holy smokes. He says, if these things are yours and they abound, you won't be unfruitful. You won't be unbarren, or you won't be uh, barren, unfruitful, unproductive. Barren, spiritually speaking, this is just inactive, just useless, ineffective. Unfruitful, just unproductive. This happens, though, to certain Christians with the heart condition that's choked with the cares of the world. Do you remember the, in Matthew in the parable of the soils? He says, uh, now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So when you see a Christian that's there's no fruit being produced in their life and they're not doing, you know, you can't see the fruit being produced, it's because the, you know, Jesus says the cares of the world have choked out that fruitfulness. Look at verse 9. He says, For he who lacks these things is short sighted, even to blindness. Short sightedness here just has the idea that this is the sort of Christian that's just, you know, the they're a Christian. There's a debate whether he's talking about Christians or non-Christians here. I think it's clear in the text that he's talking about Christians. Um, this is the sort of person that, like, they look at themselves. They maybe look at the person around them, the people around them, but they don't look into eternity. They don't look at the grand purpose of God saving them to be fruitful, to be productive in the kingdom, to honor Christ, to become Christ-like, to serve the kingdom. They're a short-sighted person. And what he says there in verse 9, you see it. He says, even to blindness. In, in this sort of state, a person is just, they're blind. They just don't get it. They're going to have to have some sort of intervention in their life uh, for them to get out of this, like, um, temporal sort of mindset. They're not thinking about 
why God really saved him. And in fact, that's what he gets. He gets that, look at the next part of the verse. He says, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. There are, I mean, it's all of us at some times, right? But when you look at a Christian that, you know, maybe they even grew up in church. Maybe they've been a Christian a couple of months. I don't know what it is, but when you look at them and you say that life is not fruitful, it's just not producing anything. You know, you, you find a frustrated Christian or else you find one that's just so worldly, they don't even, they don't care about these things. But what he says there is that they've forgotten that they were cleansed from their old sins. I think when we forget how much we've been forgiven of, you know, and when we, we forget the sinfulness of sin, as the theologians would call it, the sinfulness of sin, when we forget you know, how bad sin is, really, in God's eyes. When we forget that, we lose the appreciation for the sacrifice that Christ made. We, we lose that. Jesus died for my sins. Well, that's not all that bad because my sin's not nearly as bad as everybody else's. I mean, you know, like, look at you, you know. And when I forget this, when I forget how much I've been delivered from, and saved from, and, and how much his blood had to cover with me when I forget that. I begin to think that it's not important to be fruitful in the kingdom of God and to honor God with my life. And that causes a short-sightedness. It causes a blindness. You show me a Christian that is in the word, in prayer, serving, giving, loving, enthusiastic, worshiping, that's a person that most likely has a real good understanding of what Jesus did for them at the cross. You look at the people where you've got to twist their arm to try to get them to church, and, and maybe they have a hard time staying awake during it. It's like, those people don't realize the sinfulness of sin. They don't realize what Jesus has done for them, or they would be grateful, and they would give their life. That's what he's getting at there. He's saying, if you have these things in your life and they're abounding, that's an interesting word, abounding. Go back to, well, it's not up there, sorry. I forgot the slide. I have a hard time with those slides. I do them at like midnight and I need to change my life. <laughs> it's not the time to be doing slides. Um, <laughs> but he says, if these things are in your life and they abound, so it's not like they just show up every now and again. You know, if my wife looks at me and she goes, hey, you know, every now and again, he's kind of a godly husband. That's not the idea. I mean, I'm supposed to be abounding in these things. You're supposed to look at my life and go, man, this guy's abounding in these graces. I need to keep cultivating. If I'm a gardener and I'm just producing a little bit of fruit here, but it's mostly weeds in that whole thing, I need to get out there and weed that garden. I need to fertilize. I need to take care of the garden, man. My life needs to be abounding in these things. You know, I go to the party and nobody knows who I am. So I put on the tag, hello, my name is Abounding. <laughs> God help me. God help me. It's the Christians that apply maximum effort, lavishly adding virtues to their life that abound. The ones that are disciplined in the study of the word, the prayer, serving, loving, giving, giving of themselves. These people are abounding in these things. Anything less is going against God's will for your life. Very important lesson. The minute that you stop growing and going forward in the Christian life, you start backsliding. There's no neutral ground in Christianity. Today, you're either in a going forward state or you're in a backslidden state, one or the other, because the nature of sin if you stop weeding the garden, you can't just say, I'm going to put the garden on neutral for a little bit. You ever try that in Iowa? Do you ever try to stop weeding your garden? Do you expect to go out there next time and it's going to look like a healthy, good garden? I mean, if you stop weeding, if you stop caring for the garden, it's not going to produce any fruit. So you're either in this backslidden state today or you're in the going forward state today. All it takes to, to, if you're in that backslidden state, you know, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. This is a good way to start your year and to commit. I need to commit to these things so I can abound in these things. This is what Peter is saying to his readers and what God is saying to us. Finally, we can be assured of our calling and election, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, when he uses the word therefore, he's wrapping it up. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, there's that term again, to make your call and election sure. We can be sure that God has called us 
and elected us by applying effort to grow spiritually, we will know that God has called us. That's what he's saying. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, it's not saying that you don't fall into sin and, and you know, things like that here and again in your life, and, but you get up and you confess and you repent. But you know, if you're applying yourself to abound in these things in life, you're going to continue to be fruitful. You're not going to get into this backslidden state. You're not going to get into this state where you open the Bible and it feels like just some other book. And when you try to pray and you, you're, you, know, you don't have any zeal for singing the songs of the Lord, you're not excited to go to church. You're not going to end up in that state when, you, uh, apply, when I apply these things to my life. When I stay. And I, can, I know this from firsthand. I, by nature, I'm an artist. I'm a musician. And so... Uh, you know, that's an excuse for being crazy and all over the place, right? <laughs> he's, he's creative. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. But I go up and down, man, I got to tell you. And I can tell that when my spiritual disciplines are thin, I mean, it has a bad effect, you know, when I'm not abounding in these things, you know? And it's, it's always with me, and I don't know how it is with you, but it's always when things are going well that I get weak in my spiritual disciplines. And then God has to bring some sort of you know, difficulty into my life again. And then I go, oh, man, I need to abound in spirituality because, you know, and, and I don't know. I mean, I feel like those people in the book of Judges. You ever read the book of Judges and go, oh, stupid people? What are you? That's about you, man. <laughs> that's about me. When next time you read through the book of Judges, you think, well, that pastor, that's him. He goes on the Judges cycle, you know, like... Prosperity starts to come. Life starts getting worked out. Things are going well. Job's good. Kids are good. Everything. Oh, how's the Bible reading? How's the prayer? Well, it's, you know, I haven't had time for that lately. Just been so blessed by the Lord. I haven't had time to hang out with him. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get taken down and uh, you're like, oh, God, help me. It's like, hey, I wondered where you were at. <laughs> What's it? Thanks for coming to visit. You can be sure that you belong to him. That's a good feeling here today. That's a good feeling to know that you know that you belong to the Lord, that your calling and your election is sure. How do you know? Because over the last year of your life, you look back, you say, I've grown tremendously. Verse 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. Did you know that there's different ways to enter heaven? Did you know that? Turn over to 1 Corinthians, please, and we'll conclude with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This verse that we're going to look at, these verses, this is like, I try to remember this in my life. This is kind of like, you know, some of my life scripture right here. And try to use this as a motivation, you know, to help me to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the fact that he's like building God's kingdom along with other people. Some people are like watering, some people are, you know, planting. And, he, and he's talking about the idea of being used to build God's kingdom, which is something that every Christian has been called to do. And that's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. Look what he says. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one of you, here's, here's what you want to pay attention to. But let each one of you take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, capital D, will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So when he's talking about the day, he's talking about judgment. There's a day of judgment that will come for Christians, which is known as the Bema Seat Judgment. And then there is a judgment for the ungodly, which is coming too, called the Great White Throne Judgment. As a Christian, you won't go to that judgment, but you will go to the Bema Seat Judgment. You will be judged for your works and like Paul says there, to declare what sort of work it is, because the day will declare it. When that day comes, when that judgment comes, that is going to reveal what I did with my life and what the true motives were. Were these things done on the foundation of Christ or were they done selfishly? I'm pretty sure that most of us, when we get there, we're going to find that maybe there's some things that were done for Christ you didn't even realize. Maybe and there's some things that, you know, you thought were that weren't. 
But there is a day coming that's going to reveal what all of my works really are all about. Now, go on there. He says, uh, if anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, what that's saying is, if I build on Christ with my life, if I build, you ever heard that song, Build My Life? If I build my life on Christ, when I get to the end at the Bema seat, God's going to say, I'm going to reward you for all the things that you did as a response to what Jesus did for you. You gave your life and you served him and you did these things and there's a reward coming for that. I'm telling you, man, I'm living for that. This world is changing rapidly and I don't put any hope into what's going on here, you know. You might have a lot of hope in the next presidency. Oh, this guy, next guy's going to get in there and we're going to be a Christian nation again. Yeah, doubtful, you know. If your hope is in this life alone, that's to be pitied above all other things that I could think of. I'm living for what's next. I want to be rewarded. I want to have an entrance into heaven. Uh, look at, this is encouraging. He says, if your work is burned, you'll suffer loss, but you yourself will be saved. So in other words, there, there are some people that are going to get to that judgment seat of life, that Bema seat, and they're, they're going to realize that they just blew a big opportunity. They're going to say, I had all this opportunity to live for Christ, to have rewards, but I spent it selfishly. Very much like somebody that would like go to college and get a scholarship and then just like eat pizza and party through the whole thing and then get kicked out of school and go, oh, I just blew it. You know what I mean? They, there'll be this feeling that we missed a big opportunity, I think is what he's getting at, you know? But we have this opportunity to affect our entrance into heaven. Go back to our passage in Peter, if you would. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. I have this opportunity now to build upon Christ and that will affect my entrance into heaven. And that's what Peter's saying is if I'm, if I'm applying these things, I'm growing spiritually, this entrance into heaven is going to be affected by that. There are a lot of Christians today that are kind of just not so concerned about their entrance into heaven. They kind of have this attitude of like, as long as I get there, that's, I don't care. I'll just barely squeak in, you know what I mean? Like live however I want and, you know, and live for myself and then as long as I get there, well... You might be satisfied with that. What will your entrance be like? I want to live this life to the max for Christ. I want to grow as much as possible. When is my time to go home? I don't want to enter in through fire. I want to have an abundantly blessed entrance. I want to hear him say, say well done, good and faithful servant. And if that's you too, we need to be more diligent. We need to apply some diligence to these things. We need to grow spiritually. We need to take advantage of this opportunity that we have here to apply God's grace into our lives. What will your entrance be like? 